you know, we talked about some of those criteria and being able to train the most muscle mass. When you drop the bench press on your chest and let it bounce off your chest and then sort of grab the bar and start pushing from a few inches off of your chest, it's really it's really a front delt and tricep exercise right. at that point. You've lost these giant pec muscles. You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm here with my cohort, Nikki Sims. Hey, everybody. Before we get started on the show, I want to tell everybody, we, we've got a place now, we get asked a lot, like, what are the current offers for Barbell Logic? And so we created a page for that. It's just barbelllogic.com slash offers. So what's on there? So all of the relationships we have with like great companies like Tushy and Dominion and Microgains and, and all of those companies that we have relationships with that you can get discounts, they're there. But also like our latest ebook or any, um, any discounts that we're currently running for online coaching or things about the academy, all that stuff is there. So if you want to stay up to date, we update that all the time, barbellogic.com slash offers. And that will take you, that'll tell you what the discounts are and the discount codes and all that fun stuff there, all in one place. Awesome. So, Shopping. And that'll, that'll be there forever, hopefully. <laughs> so so we, we were talking a little bit uh, over the last couple of weeks about this idea that I continue to play around with with programming with my clients. And that is, I'm going to make a, a super blanketed statement, which is really more for a probably clickbaity title, which is that everyone should pause their bench press. Whoa, should they? Tell me more. I I think so. Now, the question is, should everyone at all points at all time during the training pause their bench press? And the answer is probably no. Mm-hmm. Um, when someone new comes to me who is a novice, I don't have them pause their bench press because it just adds an extra step of complexity to the bench press that doesn't need to be there. Right. And they're already just trying to figure out where everything's supposed to go. And you can just give them like, 35 steps to follow. This is actually really funny when we were shooting the the bench press how to video a couple months ago. It is so much harder to explain all the steps for a bench press than the squat or the deadlift or the press like combined. It's so weird. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's way more steps even though it's a, a fairly simple lift and yeah. so but you're right, one of the things that you'll you'll notice especially for coaches or for people who have trained for a long time and maybe they've coached new clients or they've got training partners that have never train before or they're trying to coach their their spouse or a, a some sort of training partner then they'll notice that that on a bench press they're kind of all a brand a newbie is kind of all over the place right mm-hmm. they touch their chest at a different spot every time mm-hmm. the lockouts at a different spot every time and they, they may be trying to touch the same spot and lock out in the same spot they just don't yeah it's just kind of all over the place they get right? wiggly, Speeds all, wiggly hands yeah. wrists start bending they're like breathing up and down while the bar is moving yeah there's a lot of stuff to remember, and once those things sort of the the groove is greased, and those things fall in place, then I start to notice as people get towards the end of LP and they start going into making their first several steps into intermediate style programming. Maybe we moved them to five sets of three on the bench press, and I start to see the problem of the bounce mm. on the bench press, mm. and that is. Most of us, everyone understands when I say the bounce is this, you know, this, it's the, the people that literally drop the weight on their chest. It bounces off their chest and, and they catch it about four inches off their chest and then return it to lockout. And you'll see, but, like, you'll see it have like kind of one consistent speed down until it gets like two inches above their chest. Then it goes really fast. Then it goes kind of fast back up and then it gets really slow. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Now. A lot of people don't actually bounce it real hard off their chest, and that's certainly certainly a, a more egregious error. A lot of people just get loose in the bottom, mm-hmm. and so maybe they've learned to not literally bounce the bar off their chest, but they're not staying tight in the bottom. Mm-hmm. So before I get to why we bench press, I want to stop for a second and actually take the bench press uh, discussion and put it on the back burner and go to the squat for a second, Mm. because everyone knows this makes sense on the squat. So if you're a coach and you have a client who's really struggling to stay tight in the bottom of a squat, what are some of the things that you might do to get them to learn how to be tight in the bottom of a squat? 
tell them to slow down. Yep. Slow yeah. what down? There's their speed on the way down. <laughs> yeah, the descent. The, yeah. the down part. Yeah, right? the descent. Yeah. So that they be they be and by doing that, they actually become more intentional about about where they're supposed to be putting their body in space. And that makes them stay tighter instead of this kind of like uh dive bomb, like I'm just gonna kind of hope for the best and see what happens here. That's right. And so when they when they do do the dive bomb what do you see? Like, how do you know that they're not staying tight in the bottom? Their depth starts to be very inconsistent. Some reps are too right. high, some are way too low. And, you know, when you squat too low, you see their lumbar flex, you see some knees come in, you see their back angle suffer. So it ruins consistency and then it ruins um, the amount of tension that they're holding at the bottom, right? That's right. So I have the same strategy that you do as a first sort of step in fixing the problem, which is slow down the descent. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, I want you to slow down the descent because I want you to feel the tightness in the bottom. I want you to feel the tightness really at the top of your hamstrings or the bottom of your butt at your sit bones at your ischial tuberosity there. That's kind of where you feel tightness. Mm -hmm. You'll feel tightness in your adductors on your inner thighs. You'll feel tightness there. And if you can't feel tightness there, you're going too fast and you're probably bouncing off your knees. Yeah. And that, that's like that spring analogy that you talked about one of the last couple of times where it's like this really tight spring that you're trying to compress, but it's not one of those like flimsy springs. That's just going to be like a quick boing. Like you have to really push down on it. That's right. Now here's, here's the next question. You and I haven't talked about this. So I'll put you on the spot. <laughs> it, and we're going to stay with the squat when that doesn't work. Cause sometimes you tell people that mm -hmm. and it just doesn't work. Do you have like, what's the next step to fix the problem? If they just can't slow down or they just can't control themselves in the bottom, what do you do? Pause them. That, that is my next step. Yeah. That's exactly right. You yeah. go to a pause squat or or I'll go to a box squat, mm. which is also a pause squat. So mm. pause squat is my first choice because I really don't want something that's sort of a depth gauge if it doesn't have to be there. I'd rather them be able to stay tight and stop in the bottom and pause mm -hmm. the squat. And if they are just, they just can't, you know, you see people that they think they're pausing, but the bar's like still moving down kind of mm -hmm. slow and they still fire up. I'm they like, I little, really never. Or they pause and they do the little cheater bounce. <laughs> That's right. Little yeah. cheater bounce. Then I'll put them on a box. Mm. Well, which makes them stop in exactly the right spot. Yeah. Right. And it teaches them how to. And on a box, when I have them sit on the box, I tell them sit on the box super slow, super easy, like a ninja, don't make any noise, mm -hmm. right? Ease onto the box. Yeah, like make your butt cheeks touch, but not your ischial tuberosity. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So now, what are we doing when we pause the bench press? Same thing. It's the same thing. Basically, and the, the, chest the chest is the box. The box. <laughs> That's right. Whoa, That's geez, right. whoa. <laughs> <laughs> we got there together. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, so it, it fixes the problem, and so what we do is we tell them to pause on the chest, mm -hmm. and we pause for about a one second count is enough. We don't need anything really ridiculously long. There are other things, you know, in that controlling the descent on a bench press, similar to the controlling the descent on the squat. And one thing we do, and what what you said on the bench press video that we've got on YouTube, is to just basically think about touching your shirt, right. touch the material of your shirt without touching your breastbone, the bony portion of your breast. When I pause or when I have a client pause the bench press, especially in the beginning when they're learning how to pause, one of the first cues I'll give them is to keep all the weight of the barbell in their hands. Mm, I, like I don't want it distributed onto their chest. Now, mm -hmm. you'll see some really advanced power lifters set the bar on their chest, sink, and throw. And mm -hmm. certainly, I'm not. That's not entirely legal, but it also is really called. And so, hey, let's do it. Let's let's do the best we can to lift the most weight, right? For but sure. for for people who are still trying to learn how to get tight, that step of teaching them to ease onto their chest, keep all the weight in their hands, so they mm -hmm. don't feel any of the weight on their breastbone. Pause for a full second count, and then fire the thing up as hard as they can. Mm -hmm. It accomplishes all sorts of things. So first off, it accomplishes learning how to descend correctly. Mm -hmm. It fixes the descent. Right? Yeah, you end up putting the bar exactly where you need to put it. That's exactly right. Or you don't, but you'll figure it out pretty quick. Yeah. It'll force you to figure it out because you have, in the same way of a squat, you have time to think about it now. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people go down and they get loose in a squat. They don't know how deep they got. Yeah. They don't know what they bounced off of. They don't know if they bounced off their adductors or their hamstrings or their knee tendons or anything, right? Because it's just too fast. 
It's the same thing with the bench press. By going down and lightly touching and pausing and throwing, you can you can concentrate on staying tight all the way to the bottom, touching the same spot every time, staying really, really tight while you're down there, and then firing back up, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And it it's going to reduce the stretch reflex a little bit, but there still is some stretch reflex that elasticity holds for a couple seconds, right? Mm-hmm. If I pause down there for three full seconds, I'm basically going to lose all of that. But we don't pause that long. We pause for one second. And really, you probably shouldn't be getting much stretch reflex on a regular touch and go bench anyway. Like, it's not like the squat where you're reaching the full kind of That's right. sw- where you're switching from concentric to eccentric. You're not really getting that much out of your your pecs or your interior del- deltoids unless you have like maybe really long lower arms <laughs> or really long <Right>. forearms. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a good point. You're not at the deepest range of motion of any of those joints or muscle groups, but when you stay tight, mm-hmm. the muscles are still lengthened. Yes. And so therefore they can fire and shorten. Whereas if yeah. they relax, mm-hmm. they're not really lengthened in a under load, right? They're, mm-hmm. they're no longer lengthened under load. And so being able to maintain that is, is a big, part of this. And then here's what I found. The first couple workouts that I do this with my clients, they're like, man, my pecs are sore. Mm. I actually haven't been using them. (laughs) Getting that eccentric contraction now. (laughs) That's right. They've just been dropping the thing. And you think about where, where are the pecs in a bench press doing the most amount of work? Right. When you switch from down to up. That's right. Down there in the bottom. Mm -hmm. And so if you're flying through that spot if you're dropping the thing and you bounce off your chest and it bounces off your chest a few inches just like you said you they lower slow they lower slow they lower slow and they get a couple inches off their chest and then boom it flies down and it bounces and boom it flies back up and then they it's almost like they catch it totally and then it goes really slow again well it goes from you controlling however much weight you have in your hands you're controlling 225 pounds down then when you let it go fast you're controlling 225 pounds plus whatever that acceleration is then you have to switch directions. Then it's even that much heavier when you're kind of essentially digging yourself out of that hole on the way That's up. Right. So That's you, want, you want to keep it weighing 225. Yeah, and I would argue that the pecs aren't getting used very much down there mm-hmm. because you have let gravity pull the weight down entirely, right? There's no, there's no lengthening under load because you just relaxed and yeah. the thing's falling down at... <laughs> 9.8 yeah. meters per second, right? And they totally, and it totally jostles their like arch and their oh, it's awful at that point. And like so much of your bench press has to do with how well you're setting up your arch and pressing your upper back against your shoulders. That if you let the bar slam into you, all that stuff just kind of pancakes. So another great analogy here: we can literally take the same, the same idea and apply it to both the squat and the deadlift as well. So on a squat, if they, if I'm having somebody box squat and they fall on the box, that's the last thing I want because now it's in a massive compressive and sheer force mm. on the back between the box and the barbell. It's not, that, that's not what that we're looking for. That sounds real fun. Good times. Yeah, it does not. <laughs> it sounds like an injury waiting to happen. So that's what we have to ease on the box. But this is also the problem that we get with people that bounce their deadlifts on the floor. Mm. Mm-hmm. It rattles them out of position. It's the yep. same thing. Totally. And so we're trying to maintain that position. So, you know, we talk about some of those criteria and being able to train the most muscle mass is one of the most important criteria we use when you drop the bench press on your chest and let it bounce off your chest and then sort of grab the bar and start pushing from a few inches off of your chest. It's Mm -hmm. really, it's really a front delt and tricep exercise at that point. You've lost these giant pec muscles. Yeah. The the biggest muscles in the whole, in the whole lift. Big origin right down the middle of your sternum. They insert your humerus, like they're giant. And then when you lose those, just like, all right, like you just said, here we go, triceps. <laughs> Let's hope this works. <laughs> you know, we, we don't typically train for aesthetics only, but when we think about bench press, who doesn't want bigger, stronger, more built pecs? Everybody does. Yeah, that's why we do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it may not be the main reason we do it, but it's certainly one of the reasons okay. we do it. We as in a small group of we. <laughs> yeah. We as in you and I in the room. <laughs> how So how often do you or is there a time that you tend to take your trainees from just their regular bench press and you make them start pausing their bench press? Is there things that you can pull out and say, this is sort of a commonality when they get about here? Or is it, are you kind of all over the place with your clients with them? I like to use it as one of the first variations that I use of the lift because it's so similar to the main lift. And yet it will only add more control at the bottom. We don't have to do a huge offset in weight and we don't have to teach them a whole new movement. 
We're not adding any new equipment. So it's just a really simple first choice for the first variation that I use. And then if we're training for a competition, I'll get it going right away. So it's either going to be a supplemental, well, I'll use it for like the the one bench press day of the week. And then I'll, I'll stick with the touch and go for the second day. But if they're training for a meet, I want all pause bench all the time. So, um, I'm, I'm a, yeah, about the same. I mean, obviously I think everybody that's listening to this probably knows, but in powerlifting, a contested bench press must be paused. Mm -hmm. And in, in basic normal strength training, it doesn't. And if there's good control of the bench press, especially in that, in that descent all the way down to the chest, I don't know if they ever have to pause it, but almost everyone at some point will start to use some momentum in the bottom of that bench press. And I start to have to add the pause. And so I'm the same way. Uh, again, if I'm thinking it through the sort of minimum effective dose changes that I tend to make, I'll move them from three sets of five to five sets of three. When I get to triples, that's a good place to start pausing. I don't tend to pause uh, sets with more than three reps. Yeah. So I like pauses with three and less. Now, some of my clients are listening right now, specifically <laughs> Father John Floater who's doing five sets of five and he has to pause all of them. The, but the guy's struggling <laughs> to stay tight in the bottom. So sorry, Father John. That's just the way it goes. Time so under occasionally, tension, penance. <laughs> <laughs> occasionally, you got to do 25 reps all paused, which is not very, and I don't do that very often, right? So, and then I'm the same way with as, as what you're saying. If people are doing their sort of volume day, three sets of five, four sets of five, five sets of five, if they're doing some hypertrophy work, you know, like you're doing right now, like some three sets of eight type stuff, I don't make them pause, or maybe I'll say pause the first rep mm-hmm. of every set. I often do that. Mm-hmm. And then touch and go after that, just slightly touch the shirt. But for sets with three reps and less, for just about all of my clients who are intermediates and beyond, I'm going to make them pause all those. And I do in my own training yeah. because I like to be able to control the weight. So that's that's a that's an important advantage. Now I think there's a su- a second other more advanced advantage to pause in the bench press, and that's that I think it will help teach you how to better use leg drive mm. when you pause the bench press because you really that, want it. Yeah, leg drive is one of the hardest things to teach, especially online, mm-hmm. because it's very difficult. You you almost need to put your hands on somebody and show them. It's a, It's also another one of those things that I want them to see me do it sometime. Like it's It's one of the only things I'll model for somebody else because and we've talked about this before. Most of the time people can't look at like, hey, watch me do a snatch and then you just do it like me. Like <laughs> that doesn't work, you know, but when they can see the way the legs help throw the bar off the chest on a bench press, my experience has been that for most people, a light bulb goes off and they're like, oh, mm-hmm. I get it right? Mm -hmm. You can throw and I can make my sternum move from my leg drive. I can drive my heels into the ground and sort of tense up my quads and it, and, and pop my hips a little bit, not pop my hips off the bench, but pop into a slightly better arch. And as I pop into a slightly better arch, it lifts my sternum. And as it lifts my sternum, that helps contribute to the leg drive on the bench press. So I have a question about that. Do you think that that is better than maybe having so big of a leg drive on the way down that your sternum reaches its max height for the entirety of the movement instead of you getting to that max height as you throw it off? That's actually, that's a great question. So first off, let's say this. I don't think a super, super arch or a super, super leg drive is really valuable for general strength training at all, mm-hmm. this is a competitive movement at this point, right? So at the point that we're doing bo- either either or of those things, mm-hmm. the goal is to bench press the most weight, probably for competition. Yeah. Or because we're trying to set an all-time PR or something like that. Now, there are two ways, I think, two ways that if you look at all of the best bench pressers who have ever lived, they all will bench in one of two styles. One style, the ones who have insanely strong triceps and can reduce their range of motion dramatically. So it also tends to be guys who have short arms will do what you're saying. They will arch, arch, arch up. They'll meet the bar with their chest as the bar is coming down so that they reduce the range of motion on the bench press as much as possible. And then their triceps only have to move the bar four or five inches to lock their thing out. And so it's almost an all a tricep, all tricep movement. There's very little pecs. And this was really the way bench pressing was done back in the 90s and early 2000s when everybody used a bench shirt. Mm. So again, probably most of our listeners know back in that 
time period of really the 80s through the through maybe 2005 to 2010, 10 years ago or so, almost all powerlifters were lifting in supportive gear. So powerlifters would put on these, they look like, um, what are those shirts, that, what are those like jackets that they put you in in the crazy houses? The, straight you know jacket. About? Straight, it looks like a straight jacket. <laughs> But instead of your arms folding over yourself, they would like be straight out in front like you were a mummy. Like mummies, like, yeah. Like you're a walking dead. And, uh, you know, it, it just, and it was made out of denim or canvas or something crazy. So just imagine like if you put on the tightest pair of jeans you ever wore in your life and you were guaranteed that the jeans were not going to tear mm -hmm. or blow out. How much more could you squat in that pair of jeans? More. <laughs> something more. So good. And it's like so a bench shirt was basically like jeans for your bench press. <laughs> And it was made with like triple reinforced denim, super thick denim or canvas, and it wouldn't tear. It's ridiculous, right? But you think about it, there was no way to let the bar sink into your chest right. and leg drive throw because the bench press shirt was too tight. Mm. And so they did the the style that you're talking about, which is that super big arch and it's all tricep. And a lot of the the West Side Powerlifter guys did it that way. And they also didn't tend to throw the bar back over their face as much. They tended to touch low and they would press almost straight up. So it was almost like hmm. a decline bench press for them. Big giant arch, very wide grip, belly up. They used to say belly up, belly up. That was like a, you know, one of those terms they would use, which is sort of like meet the bar with the top of your belly is what they yeah. would do to be able to reduce the range of motion. The other style of lifters, the ones that you'll tend to see, I, I think this you'll see this if you play around on YouTube for all, the ones that tend to be the strongest raw without a bench press shirt and who have never benched in a bench press shirt before tend to do the sink and throw, mm -hmm. which is what I'm talking about here. So you get nice and tight. You still get a nice arch, but it's not a ridiculous arch. You have you could theoretically arch more. You could theoretically have more leg drive and you bring the bar down under nice control. Although some of those guys actually bring down really fast, even somewhat out of control and let it, but rather than bouncing off their chest because they're not allowed, they let it hit the hit their breastbone. They sink their breastbone down a few inches, and then they fire their breastbone up like they're doing a chest bump, like with your buddies after you made like the game winning three pointer shot in a basketball game. You, but you chest bump the barbell, and as you chest bump the barbell, you you initiate the leg drive. You fire your heels down. You hit that bigger arch, and you throw the bar from the top of your belly back over your chin and you lock it out over your chin so it's got a much more diagonal bar path to it mm -hmm. that and sounds so, like it takes a lot of precision and timing practice it does and i can remember so i can remember when i was first uh coaching uh ness ozest who's one of our one of our coaches and i was online coaching her but i would see her three four five times a year from you know at seminars and whatnot and so uh, she just couldn't get the leg drive. She was going to compete in a powerlifting meet. She couldn't get the leg drive, couldn't get the leg drive. And I said, man, so I, we had a trip, and you were on this trip, I think, where uh, she was in L.A. at the time, went down to L.A., and I got to just work with her for like an hour and a half and teach her the leg drive. She became a master of the <laughs> leg drive. And I see this out of females a lot because they tend to be more flexible. They can get into a bigger arch than a lot of guys can. And so for for – for hyper mobile people, which tend to be female, although there are guys that can do this too, especially lighter weight guys, they have a little more play in their arch. And she learned how to bring that bar down super tight, the base of her chest, kind of sink, and you would watch her throw. I bet she got four inches of throw out of her chest alone. I mean, out of her breastbone Whoa. and leg drive alone. She would that's throw amazing. it that hard. It was crazy. She was great at it. So, that's cool. so that's one of the reasons we do it. Now, again, that's an advanced movement. But it's very difficult at where you can kind of back this up a couple steps is for clients who are struggling with leg drive. And you can see, and by the way, this is actually why we're doing it. I, I gave him a hard time a minute ago, but why we're doing it with Father John Floater is because he actually doesn't have a hard time staying tight on the descent on a bench press. He just doesn't have any leg drive. Mm. The, the guy could literally be, uh, uh, what's, what is it when you cut your legs? Legs off. Well, I mean, it could be like a, like a, like, yeah, it could be like a double amputee for his legs, and you wouldn't notice any difference. <laughs> the guy's just an upper body bench presser. But the thing is, he's a way better squatter and deadlifter than he is a bench presser. He's made us, he's got super strong legs. Yeah. So it's like, man, we got to figure out how to use your legs on the bench, on the bench press. Oh, and so that's why he's pausing. So he's pausing and sinking and throwing. CJ Gocher, one of our coaches, I'm, I'm coaching him right now. He's got a meet coming up. He's doing the same thing. We've adapted to using, the, the sink and throw. I have a question. Do you ever have a client wear a belt for their bench press? 
Yes. Or is that, do. do you leave that up to personal preference? What do you think? I about tend that? to leave it up to personal preference. I do. You may have a different answer for this. In general, I have done both. When I'm competing in powerlifting, I tend to wear a belt more often. I think a belt for sure helps to solidify the Valsalva maneuver. We want a good, strong Valsalva on any of the lifts. We know the spine isn't loaded. So in the same way that it sort of helps create that inner abdominal pressure so that the muscles that tend to move the bar, like on a squat and deadlift, like the muscles around your hips, it helps to transfer the energy from the hips into the barbell. We know that's not the case on the bench press, right? Mm -hmm. But I do think you tend to get a better Valsalva maneuver and you can get a little tighter. Um, so I'll use it some, but I tend to use it for per leave it for personal preference. What about you? Yeah, I'm always just like, yeah, if you want to wear a belt, wear it. Like, I, yeah. I've never felt a good trade off. But now as we have this discussion, I'm wondering if that would be at all useful for someone who's not really connecting their lower body to their upper body. Like maybe sure. there needs to be some like tactile feedback there through the abdomen that could be helpful. I don't know. Yeah, I think, I think so for sure. I think yeah. that's actually a really good point. So yeah, it's probably another great learning piece that if you're trying to put the leg drive together and you have a hard time getting the leg drive, adding a belt probably does a pretty good job of doing that. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I try to do with somebody when they're, I'm teaching them the leg drive is I, I, I don't even put the barbell in their hands. I just have them lay down on a bench press like they're going to bench press. And then I see if they can get their legs to fire and make their breastbone pop up. Mm -hmm. Can you make your breast, the bottom of your breastbone pop up using your legs? Mm -hmm. And if you've never done that before, just do it before your first couple, before your first couple sets and do it with the empty bar. It's really easy. You know, you can play around and do it with the empty bar. Yeah. Um, and then, and then I keep practicing that with, with the lighter weights. I do the same thing on deadlifts. You've seen me deadlift before. When I deadlift my first early sets, 135, 225. I do this real weird looking like hip pop at the top. I get to the top, yeah. I like, squeeze my glute hard, I pop it, and the bar comes flying off my legs at the top. Mm -hmm. Well, it's obviously not going to do that when it's heavy. It's going to be too heavy. It's not going to matter. But, you know, I've kind of got bad hips, and I'm not great at remembering to pop the hips. I tend to lose my deadlifts like you do kind of at the top, at lockout. And I'm trying to sort of – this is probably not a true – this is a bro science word. I'm trying to set the, set the motor pattern, set the central nervous system to say, hey – Finish this lift quick mm. at the top, pop, throw the hips, squeeze the butt, do those sort of things. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. Some of that may just be placebo, but it seems to work pretty well to make sure that then as the weight starts getting heavy, I've already sort of set the tone. We're not locking this thing out slow. Yeah. We're trying to lock it out fast. And so I had a thought think, about leg drive that I think sometimes if people may not be getting leg drive, it's always worth it to check that they're, that they're sticking on their bench. Like yes. sometimes people leg drive and they slide up the bench. So if you're at, not like anybody can go to Globo Gyms right now, or if you have a really slick bench, either get one of those A7 shirts or get that shelf, that bubbly shelf lining that you, you see in, in kitchens, cabinets. that you put in cabinets, and that'll yeah. help you stick to your bench and make sure your floor doesn't, is like grippy enough that your bench doesn't slide. That's right. Like some, sometimes you just don't want to use your leg drive because you're going to like literally slide yourself out of position. So make sure those two things are secure. That's right. So one of the things I look for when I buy a bench a bench press bench. We, we do not have any sponsorships with equipment. What I love about the rep fitness 5,000 bench, whatever that is, the 5,000 that's got the, the mm -hmm. single post at the feet is that it's the, the material on the pad is like a, Soft. it's like half rubber and half Marine vinyl. Like most yeah. bench presses are just kind of vinyl. Yeah. Um, and that it's, it's more rubberized. And so yeah, it's it, nice. The newer Rogue ones are a lot like that too. The Thompson fat pads are like that. I just don't like a I don't like a bench press that wide. Uh, a lot of guys do. I can't imagine very many ladies would like it in this unless their shoulders are broader than mine. Yeah, you mine totally are. just it's, run into the bench. <laughs> it's too wide for me, and I'm 300 pounds. Yeah. You know. Um, you want me to tell you a fun cheater story? Ah, uh, totally. So back in the early 2000s when I competed in powerlifting, and this is before A7 came out. So if you haven't checked out A7, they're one of our favorite. They, they create, they make these shirts that, that have like a rubberized back to it. And they work great for squats mm -hmm. because they help hold the bar and they put you in, in same thing. You know, it helps you stick to the bench. Now, I think for most powerlifting federations, they're not legal to wear, right. which is kind of weird, but I don't know who cares. So, but they weren't out there. So there was no, that wasn't an option. What we would do the day before the meet is we would go to an art supply store and we would buy stickum spray. <laughs> and back in the warm up room, we you know, you'd put on your singlet, which by the way, singlets are usually nylon and they're slick. Yeah, they totally right? are. Right, singlets tend to be slick. 
and we put on, you'd have a t-shirt on underneath your singlet and you put that singlet on and then you'd have your workout partner spray your, your upper back with stickum spray Smart. so that you would stick. By the way, you know what else you can spray with stickum spray? Your butt. So if your butt comes off the bench a little bit, the material sticks. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. My client, Peggy, if you were listening to this, do not do that. I'll know now. <laughs> but she gets real loose shorts and then she sprays it with stickum spray and her butt can come off the bench nine inches, We've but her shorts are still, <laughs> still on the bench. So, <laughs> yeah. Funny. So that, I mean, it, it's, that's probably about all we have to say about that. It's, here's, here's the, it's pretty simple. And if we think about it in a in a minimum effective dose sort of uh, logical progression, when you start your bench press, you just you just bench. You you know a full mm -hmm. range of motion bench. It has to touch your chest, mm -hmm. and it locks out over the shoulder joint. That's it. And as time goes on, uh, you'll probably almost accidentally learn how to get some momentum there. And momentum is is not a terrible thing, but it doesn't help the pecs contribute to the bench press. And I want to be able to do that because I want to use them the most muscle mass possible. And again, we're not talking about competitive lifting yet. And so as you start to get to that spot where you go maybe from three sets of five to five sets of three, that's probably a good time to start to pause those bench press reps. And I would start with pausing all of them. And, and just yeah. like you said, it doesn't take much of a, it doesn't take much of a deload to usually buy back. It's like 5%, right? Yeah. And I much. can bench as much pause as I can touch and go. Now, once you learn how to do it and you're efficient, when you first start, it's kind of hard because you've been mm -hmm. used to, to drop in the bar and bounce it off your chest. But it's a good place to start to pause your bench press to learn how to use more muscle mass. You'll control the bar better in the bottom, and it'll also help you learn how to leg drive better moving forward. And then as time goes on, if you want to adopt some of those advanced techniques like a much bigger arch to reduce the range of motion for a, for a competitive bench press or a sink and throw with a giant leg drive, for a competitive bench press, then you're you're already down that road without getting into this area that's sort of like, I don't know, is this kind of cheating? And I'll, and I'll be honest, it is kind of cheating by the time you get there. By the time you sink and throw or by the time you have this ridiculous arch and wide bench press mm -hmm. and you've reduced the range of motion, but you're, you're playing within the rules of powerlifting. So you're a competitive lifter. That's what you're going to do, right? If I was a major league baseball player and they allowed metal, aluminum bats, titanium bats, I, use, I wouldn't use a wooden bat because... You know, like I think Major League Baseball should use wooden bats because it's like it's a historical sort of game. But if they change the rule, I'm not going to handicap myself. Mm -hmm. And so use it. But for normal lifters, it's still a really good reason. There's a there's good reasons to eventually get yourself to learn how to pause and throw because it'll help you control just the same way it is for most people when they squat to learn how to pause in the bottom of a squat or sit on a box and fire up off a box. The same reason we stop a deadlift after every single rep at the bottom and it's a dead stop because we have to learn how to stay tight get tight at the bottom not just rattle and bounce around down there um all of those things are are beneficial and so that's why we do it yeah i mean you're dealing with a ball and socket joint that even when the bar is on your chest you have so much range of motion with, the, with your humerus and that's different with a squat like yeah your hip is also a ball and socket but when you're at the bottom it's not like you can wiggle your knees around because your feet are where they're going to be. There's some, you know, obviously you can move your knees in or out to some extent, but like with the bench press, you can touch the wrong spot, still have these flappy elbows, yep. touching the correct spot, still have these flappy elbows. So yeah, the more you pause, the more you get used to having that consistent groove that you've talked about before. That's right. Yeah. yeah and that's, we, we hadn't touched on that and I have other, we can even probably do another show on this, but it's another thing that tends to help people who tend to flare the elbow early. Mm. They're flaring the elbow early because they're getting loose at the bottom and they're trying to regain tightness yeah. in the bottom, right? So you, you see people and they'll actually descend with their with their their humerus tucked fairly well. And as soon as they start the concentric phase, they chicken wing out. Well, what mm -hmm. are they doing when they chicken wing out? They're getting tightness in their pec is what they're doing. So they're, they're showing me that they lost tightness in their pec on the way down and they're trying to regain it. And they're like, I don't know how to get tight now. And so they chicken wing out. So a good thing to do is slow them down on the descent, make them tuck, and everything is better. I like it. Awesome. All right. That's another episode of the Barbell Logic Podcast. Thanks for listening. We will be here most Mondays with new episodes from Nikki and I. And then about once a month, we're going to bring in those series. And so we've got uh, some more of the uh, best of the beginning type series, stuff on technique and all kinds of fun stuff. And a uh, special treat is coming. I heard about... Uh, I think Mr. Sullivan, Dr. Sullivan, is going to do a series for us on barbell training and health and quality of life and all that fun stuff coming up soon. So be on the lookout for that. Super excited for that upcoming series 
That's exciting. Um, Dr. Sullivan. So again, you can listen to Barbell Logic. You get you can go to barbelllogic.com slash offers to see all the best new offers. And we have got a ridiculous, never before done sale that we're gonna run that we're just gonna test out for three days coming up kind of the end of the first week of August. So this oh. will come out on Monday. Hold tight for another few days, about the end of this week. Be watching social media and see if you're interested. We think we have removed all barriers to entry and all friction in joining Barbell Logic. If you want to try it and you're just not sure if yeah. you can pull the trigger, we're going to make it easy for you. So That's stay cool. tuned for that. So thanks for listening. If you get a chance, give us a five-star review on iTunes or any of your favorite podcast hosts, Overcast or um, Stitcher or iHeartRadio. We're on all those fun podcast hosts. We'd love for you to say a nice word about us and share it with your friends. Mm -hmm. And so we will catch you next week. Cool. Thanks, everybody.